Frustration. We've all experienced this. Despair. And apathy. <laughs> so I'm sure all of us have experienced this during our coding experiences, whether it's work or in our life experiences. And it's, it's something to reflect upon. You know, what causes these emotions we have, these strong reactions to our day-to-day coding. And our, our hero, Matt, he's come to save us from all these bad feelings that we have. It's a little dark there, but you know, the reason Ruby was created to, with the intention, one of the intentions was to help develop our happiness. It's very unique language in that way, that there was a humanistic kind of focus instead of trying to solve you a switching problem, like C was, for example. Matt's really wanted to create something so he could be happy and um, not bang his head against the wall so much. Recently, I uh, reaffirmed this. I took a contract. Kind of was getting a little bored in the web domain. I've been doing Ruby professionally for six or seven years. And um, I decided to take a C++ contract. Um, very interesting domain, 3D visualization, kind of like a holodeck that you walk into. Really cool stuff. But I soon realized after the end of the first day <laughs> that <laughs> I was again banging my head against the wall, you know, whether it was the compiler or some sort of thing. And it wasn't that I was, you know, I had reviewed my C++. I didn't feel like there was any problems with my language or stuff. It was just a general inefficiency and kind of unhappiness that came with that. And the project ended up being a success. It was a fun project. I embedded a web server with a RESTful interface and kind of used some Rails kind of techniques in it. But it was just a pain in the butt. So happiness, that's something that for a lot of us is fleeting. It's something we all experience, obviously. But it's something once you reflect on it, you lose that. So if you, if you feel happy and then you kind of say, well, what is happiness? Then you probably aren't happy anymore because you're kind of in an analytical, more thoughtful mode. So how many of you feel fulfilled in your work, in your everyday life? About half the room. That's good. <laughs> Not every day. Not every day, of course. <laughs> so what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to look at this a little more, kind of step back and, and look at happiness in our work environment and how we could potentially cultivate that and make that a better experience. So if you really look at all the things we do that make us happy, it's really all about order and control. So all the things we do, whether it's at work or at home, your hobbies, you're really trying to put some order to your consciousness. So whether it's creating music or writing code, busting out a new open source project, there's really that sense of a control and order that is giving you happy, happiness and fulfillment in your everyday life. So the more we can look at how to order our consciousness and make it make sense and have control over that, the more happier you'll be. So one good example, like I mentioned, is music on both sides. When a composer is creating music, he's trying to capture a certain emotional feel a certain state of consciousness at that time. And then he's able to share that with you. So I'm sure many of you have come home from a hard day at work and you put on your favorite record and you just feel naturally elated and happy. And it's really that he's rearranging your consciousness to connect with that emotional feel. So it's easy to find what happiness isn't. And disorder is one of them. This, this isn't my bedroom here. I'm sure it's looked like that at some times. But one thing that a lot of us don't realize is that your mind is naturally chaotic. And disorder is kind of a natural state for most of us. If your mind isn't trained or you don't have something to focus on, usually you'll run into your mind will just go into random mode. So we often think that our mind's very structured, but we're usually filling it with habits and other things, whether it's TV or talking. Um, it's really filling it with other things. If we really sit back and just sit around you know, things will come up that you maybe don't want to face, and it's generally chaos. So this is a really ex simple example of a gem file. Um, it's kind of a pet and peeve of mine when I come into a project. And this gem file is not too bad, 
but you can see it's not in alphabetical order, which is something I really like. These groups are a little crazy. So it's the general sense, so this is what I like to do, you know, is put them in alphabetical order, order everything into groups. It might seem like a trivial thing, but for me, it gives me a sense of order. So if I come into a new project and the gem file is the first thing I look at and it's chaotic, there's something that just, from the beginning, makes me feel off. So it's similar to the broken window syndrome. So some of you may have heard of this. If you go into a, a neighborhood, whether it's run down or not, and there's a few broken windows everywhere, it gives a general sense of the neighborhood being run down and that there might be more crime than there is. So we, we experience that in our code all the time. So all these little things kind of add up so that you feel like your code base is a wreck and that it doesn't feel like things are in line and you have no control over that. Especially when you're, if you're taking over a legacy application. And you know how most of us, our initial thing is we want to rip and replace. Because we want control of that. We just want to throw out all this code we don't understand and just start anew. <clears throat> so when we talk about happiness, one of the major things in a lot of research that show where people find fulfillment and happiness in their day-to-day -day life and in their personal lives is the flow experience or the zone. We kind of all use that term a lot. Everybody experiences it, but we don't really think about it too much. Like, what is that? It's kind of like sleep. I mean, that sleep is an altered state of consciousness. It's a pretty amazing thing. And flow is a similar, similar thing. It actually alters your state of consciousness. <clears throat> so I'm sure we've all experienced getting in a sense of kind of those when we're in the zone and time just dissipates. You just lose all concept. You look up and it's six hours later. It's three in the morning and you didn't even realize it. Um, another thing that might happen is you lose, to really be in the flow is your self-consciousness, your idea of self really dissolves. So there's kind of four main tenets we're going to look at to help cultivate flow that you should be able to apply in your everyday life or at least reflect on these kind of characteristics of how you could potentially cultivate the flow experience. The first one is having a clear goal. The second one is having immediate feedback. The third one is being able to concentrate on the goal. And, and the fourth one is making sure your skill level is able to attain that goal and actually to accomplish that goal. This was a tweet that DHH tweeted about a week ago. And the tweet is, I've tried many answers for what do you get out of working on open source? But the truth, the truth is, the act of creation in its, is its own reward. So that's kind of an autotelic experience, which is really when you do something and the end result is for its own good. So the act of doing it is rewarding. You don't really need a goal. And so there's a lot of things we do, just hacking on open source or some kind of guess, misguided things. You might do something without a clear goal, and it might be fulfilling. But usually there's a combination of external factors and internal factors especially in your day-to-day. -day. So usually there's an external input, like say it's a feature or a client request, and you take that in, and then you work on that towards that goal, and then it becomes an internal rewarding experience. So like I mentioned, a goal is the, is the number one thing you need to be able to really cultivate this flow experience. So you, must, you have to have something very clear, definable. It could be a use case, in most of our cases, a feature. So many of you probably have ex experienced, if you've been coding for days and then you realize you're not really sure what you're trying to accomplish. Um. <clears throat> and then the key thing is to be able to focus on that goal. So if you're not able to stay focused on that goal and concentrate on it, you're not obviously not going to be able to concentrate, be able to accomplish it. So I'm going to look at several techniques that we can do to help improve our focus and improve our concentration to stay clear on the goal at hand. One tool I use is Freedom. Does anybody use that? It's a great tool, and it basically just cuts the internet off. <laughs> you can still have local access, so if you need to run a local web server, but you actually have to reboot your computer <laughs> to, get, to enable internet access. So you can't cheat. So I, I really like doing this, and I'm sure some of you have experienced either on a plane flight or like yesterday had forced internet out outage. It really helps you focus as much as you, you, know, you get working towards a goal and it gets a little tough, especially if you're working on your own and you want to do everything but that goal at hand. So I'd recommend checking out this goal if you want some sanity. Another technique is the Pomodoro technique. Most of you are probably familiar with that. Is everyone heard of that or familiar with that? So this is something I use every day, pretty much all the time. Um, and it's a very simple technique. Basically, usually you have a 25-minute 
time segment, and you start the clock, and you stay focused on one goal, one feature, in that 25 minutes. If you finish within that time, you're supposed to stay focused on it, refactor, reflect on it. And then you shouldn't have no distractions. If email comes, phone calls, it's an easy way, especially if you're on a team, to avoid distractions. You can just say, oh, I'm in a Pomodoro, don't bother me. Another nice thing about it is it really helps assess whether you should keep on going. You might be working on a feature too long, but if you're getting 10 minutes, you know, 13 minutes into it, and you're like, oh, we have 10 minutes to go, we need to wrap this up. Or we're going to have to do a whole other 25 minutes. Is it worth really continuing? And then you might hit that 25 minutes, and you're like, well, maybe it's good enough for right now. You know, it's clean, it works, it's maybe not ideal, so I'm not going to spend another 25 minutes. So that's a really nice side effect of it. And I use this in my day-to-day -day life. I think it's come, become a little structured, but almost everything I do now is measured in Pomodoros. And that's kind of a way to blend your work and personal balance. So if I have to do the dishes, it's like, okay, I'll do them for 25 minutes. <laughs> then I'll move on to the next activity. If I'm going to practice guitar, I might do four Pomodoros. Or meditate, I'll do a 25. So it's kind of nice nights to blend your work in life that way, and it makes Pomodoros and work a lot easier and make a lot of sense. Um, here's just some applications you can try out if you want to try this out. Tomatoes is a really popular one. I don't tend to use this because it's web-based, and I like to work offline a lot. Timebox is one I'm using right now. It does cost a little bit, but it has a nice interface and kind of shakes the screen when 25 minutes comes up. Focus Booster is a free one. I really like this. Is, one's a little better than Timebox because it actually understands the five-minute break. So you're supposed to take, do, work for 25 minutes, then have a five-minute break. And Zone's a really interesting one. This was done by Vojto, who was a apprentice from Slovakia that came and worked with us. And the neat thing about here, we were doing Pomodoros and pairing on Pomodoros, and it kind of drove him crazy because he felt like he didn't really get into the zone until about 25 minutes. So what his tool does at 30 minutes, it kind of lets you know, hey, 30 minutes has happened, you know, and you can just keep on going. So I use this every once in a while when I want to work at least 30 minutes, and if I just want to keep on going and, and stay focused, it's, it's a nice effect. That's available on the App Store for 99 cents or something. Yeah, one called Pomodoro that actually goes on your desktop or on your test bar. That's really nice, too. So another technique that um, I highly recommend is meditation. Um, a daily meditation to help uh, focus on things, concentrate. And the difference between meditation, you know, we all kind of loosely talk about running, you know, is a meditative thing. Pretty much anything is meditative in a sense, but you're really more getting in that zone experience when you feel like you're meditating. When you're meditating internally, you're actually st starting to still that randomness and chaos I talked about. So it's really the only way to dive below kind of the things we do that keep us happy and keep our minds straight. So it's a very simple technique. Um, if you just sit down and, and stay aware of the breath going through the nose, you can just sit down five minutes, 10 minutes. You want to work up to 25 minutes, so it's a Pomodoro. Um, <laughs> and just feel the sensation of the, of the breath coming through the nose. And, if, and thoughts will come up. You might have some brilliant ideas, just kind of be aware of them and file them back. And they just always come back to the sensation of the breath. And you're going to see, you know, within a week of doing this every day, even if it's just five minutes, you're going to notice ability to concentrate a lot greater during your work. Oh, this turned out really dark. Um, <clears throat> so this is a picture of pairing with our friend Dave Hoover, who came and visited us, and Lake, who's in the audience as well. And so pairing is a great way to stay on tra task. So if you have someone sitting beside you, and you want to go check your email, they're like, no, 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 you're supposed to stay on, your, on task, stay on goal. So it's very, that's a, one way that pairing can help you get into the zone. Another tenet that's really important is, like I mentioned, is immediate feedback. So ideally, you want to ha have a constant, something that's constantly telling you that you're succeeding, you're getting close to your goal, you're almost there, you're doing OK. So this is where behavior-driven development, or TDD, really makes a lot of sense if you apply it in this context. So otherwise, you know, you're, if you're working on a goal, the way you get feedback is clicking on a browser or waiting for the client to find a defect. You know, it might be a week or, or multiple minutes to even get any sort of uh, feedback. <clears throat> so when you're driving through behavior-driven development, you have a clear feature that you start on. You write the spec for that integration text. You immediately have some feedback that it's failing. It's not working. You start working on your unit level test, or spec level test, test unit, whatever you prefer. Then you're getting little baby steps of feedback. You're always getting closer and closer to your goal. And then you're ultimately getting 
the green that your integration is okay. So it's a very good way. You know, initially, if you're not if you're not used to TDD, it's more of a skill problem that you just need to get used to doing it. But once you really get used to it, it's more effective at getting in the zone and really having a, a fulfilling experience. And again, here's a better picture of Dave and Lake pairing. So this is a pairing's another example of immediate feedback because you have your your buddy sitting right beside you. And he's able to give you some sort of feedback. No, we're going down the wrong path. You know, we're yak shaving or something. So a key thing of attaining the goal is making sure your skill level is high enough to, to, to be able to accomplish the goal. So a lot of us might get frustrated or anxious when something seems too hard, or we might blame an external source, maybe the client or the manager or our boss, or we might a third-party package. And it, it's possible that that is a problem, but it also might be a, poss a problem that it might be that the problem is really our own skill set, that we really don't have the skills to accomplish this goal, and we're just getting frustrated. So we're going to look at a few ways to improve these skills. So hopefully your company supports this. So Corey likes to make the analogy of uh, Musicians performing. Like if you're a musician and you spend a lot of time doing scales, very rote kind of repetitions to not only get a sense of long-term memory and muscle memory, but so that when you're up performing, you can just let it flow and it's in your subconscious. And it would be quite a sight if you got up to see a band play, you paid $60, and they open up with A major scale. It probably wouldn't be very exciting. But they've probably done A major scale 60,000 times, and it's part of the song, and it's part of the experience of making music. So ideally, you shouldn't be doing, learning fundamental skills on the job. You're basically performing when you're working on your client's time or your company's time. So hopefully your company supports something like Craft & Culture. There's a lot of companies that do that, Relevance and Apiva and, and Pivotal. They all allow the developer's time outside of billable time to work on open source or work on fundamental skills like learn Vim and things. So if your company doesn't support that, I would encourage that. And um, otherwise, you'll have to do it on your own time. Code retreats are another example of very effective ways to improve your general skill base. Is anybody familiar with code retreats or been to one? A few people. <laughs> this is one we're having at the end of the month in Floyd. You guys are welcome to southwestern Virginia if you'd like to fly over. Um, it's the only one right now that's actually two days. And it's in the country in a, in a small one stoplight town. So not only do you get to retreat in code, but you re retreat from city life. So a lot of folks that come in from the city get some nice quiet time. And, the, and the, um, the schedule is usually you spend a whole day focusing on one problem. It's often Conway's game of life. And you do about six or seven sessions of an hour each. And then you rotate to a new pair. And at each hour, you actually throw your, your problem away. So whatever code you're working on, you actually ditch it and throw it in the trash. And so that does several things. It helps you detach from your solution or what you thought was right. And it also helps you focus on very fundamental things. So each time you redo it, you, know, you might test drive it a little different. You might create a different abstraction. It's a very effective way to come back or to step outside of your normal day-to-day -day production. Another good technique are katas and ruby cones. So katas were originally created by Dave Thompson. And there's small pro problems. Dave Thompson? Dave Thomas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, they usually take 10 minutes to 30 minutes. And you're focusing on an algorithm or a very basic problem. And they might seem kind of, kind of trivial, especially if you've been coding for a long time. You're like, oh, I could do this in my sleep. But, but you see people like Uncle Bob, who's probably been coding longer than most of, of us has been alive. And he still does these, these katas. He does them all the time. And he loves them. Every time he does them, he seems to enjoy them more. If you want to check out his videos, you can see some crazy sword-wielding action <laughs> of him doing some katas. And Ruby cones are kind of a similar concept. They're little Ruby problems to help you learn Ruby. So I recommend doing these quite often. Another key thing that I think is daily practice. So anything you want to be good at, you need to do daily for some amount of time. So whether it's even five minutes or an hour, if you're trying to learn Vim, do a little bit of just focusing on Vim for half an hour every day. 
And what happens with daily practice is it really becomes part of your muscle memory, comes into your subconscious, and it becomes intuitive. So you might not be able to measure a lot of improvement. Um, the day to day, you're not going to notice a lot of difference. But after a month, you're going to notice a, a drastic difference than you were a, a month before that. And it almost becomes magical. Like anything I've done daily for a long period of time, it, it reaches a point that there's some kind of magic that happens because it becomes subconscious and intuitive. And that in, intuitive feeling is really what you want. If anybody's coded for a long amount of time, um, I've been developing for about 15 years, and you just get this intuitive sense sometimes, especially on a system that you're really involved in. But even if it's a system I've never worked on, I'll come in and someone will explain a problem, and you just feel in your gut that something's not right. And, and there's not really any logical kind of way to see how you got to that conclusion, but it's often right. And especially with design and just general smells, you'll just get an intuitive sense. And that's really what you want to, to cultivate on. So cultivation, learning how to practice. So really, we're learning how to practice. Some people don't really even know how to practice. You know, it's really a skill just to be able to practice, to be able to do katas and be able to get the focus and discipline to, to do these. And it can be strategic and it can be very determined. You can't just know how to do something, you need to actually do it. So someone might look at a kata and be like, oh, I know how to do that, and feel like you're getting some reward from that. You actually need to do it. So this is a nice graph that relates to a lot of concepts I was talking about. So on the left is the challenge level of an activity, of a goal. And on the bottom is the skill level. And you can see if, you're, if the challenge is really low and your skill level is low, you're going to get a sense of laziness and just apathy. There's nothing to really do. As your skill level increases, you may be bored at something. So we've probably all experienced that. And it might be that the job is just not challenging enough. You need to find a new job, or you need to ask for a promotion, or move on to another project. If your skill level is really high, you might be more relaxed. It might not be as boring. You might be able just to just tackle these small tasks and know there's something else to go to. <clears throat> as your skill level increases, you can see as, if the challenge is really high, this is where you start to get worried and anxiety. So we've probably all experienced that, something that's really hard and we just don't have the skills, so you're going to become anxious. So you might want to reflect, maybe I need to improve my skills. It's not something external that's causing this anxiety. And then if we have a high skill level and a high challenge, we're going to get more to that flow level. We're first going to feel like we're in control. You know, we've got this under control. We can handle it. And then you'll move into this kind of more transcendental kind of flow experience. <laughs> so flows can also be addicting. So you don't want to end up like this guy. Um, but he's winning. He's winning. <laughs> In his own world, he's winning. <laughs> so we've all experienced this as well. You know, as soon as you get control of something, especially as you know, the world around you is falling apart, and you're able to focus on code, and you're in total control, and everything's ordered, everything's great, you're going to shut down everything around you, and that's all you're going to want to do. So this is something you want to be careful about. And that's kind of where the antisocial behavior of not only computer people, I think they get a bad rap, but most artists and musicians will just sit around for eight, 10 hours and just focus on that flow experience or getting in that zone. So what we want to do is look how we can increase the flow experience in other parts of our life. You're going to get the same rewards and the same happiness that you get from programming if you apply that to your family life. Learn how to have hobbies and other activities. You're going to find the rewarding very similar. So concluding, I mentioned four main things to focus on if you want to try to cultivate the flow experience in your day-to-day -day life. So that's having a clear goal, so making sure that you understand the goal with your clients, that everything's a clear use case or feature, or some kind of external endpoint that you have to work towards. But also making sure you have immediate feedback, so making sure that when you're working on that goal, you have some sort of feedback to know that you're succeeding at that. And also learning how to concentrate and focus on that goal so you can really stay tasked just on one goal and you're not moving around everywhere. And then also really assessing if your skill set is, is good enough 
to take on the challenge of that certain goal. Right, so that's all I have. I'm Gustin Prudner. I uh, founded a consulting firm called Entryway, and we've been working on a product called Sea Leaf Lake lately. That's a, a tool for CSAs and farmers to help distribute local food. My Twitter handle is Gustin, and we have, definitely have some minutes left. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's something I missed. Unfortunately, my notes um, got lost when I set up. But that was a point I was going to bring up. I mean, when you look at this, you know, when I was working on that C++ program, you know, the challenge was high. It was very interesting. My skill level is very, I've done C++. I did it for about eight years. It's still pretty high. But there was something else missing. It wasn't just I wasn't skilled in the tools. It wasn't. The language itself had inherent problems. So if you have a high challenge and a high skill level in Ruby versus other languages, there's something different about Ruby. I'm going to get stuff done more efficiently. There's, there's, it's just easier to use. And that's something that's not really brought up a lot when you talk about flow is the tool you're using or the technique you're doing, is that efficient enough to get to that flow experience? So that can be an inhibitor to get to that upper quadrant. Do you think it might be because Ruby allows you to focus on the challenge rather than the minutia of yeah. getting there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you can really stay focused on the idea or the domain. So you're not wrestling with, with other things outside of that. So that's, I think, what we really enjoy about it because we really get to focus on the business domain problems, not how to, you know, multiple frameworks of doing just stuff that people do all, all the time. Um, I'd like to add that when you're training yourself, learning something new. What helps me a lot is like having strokes. Like, um, when I look back and I, uh, I'm doing something for days, and I say, wow, I'm doing this for every day since a month. And it really helps me stay motivated, and I can look back and see every day I made a small step forward, mm -hmm. and, uh, increase it. So saying that strokes helps me really like, yeah, getting into some kind of upper right corner. Yeah, it's a good point. When I do daily practice, I've been using Corey's tool, Mercury app. Um, it's an it's a <laughs> excellent tool. Everybody should go use it right now. <laughs> but I, it's, a, you can just, it's a way to enter um, a daily activity, and you can enter an emotional feel for that or how the day went, and then just a little blurb. So I, I used it for multiple months straight, everything from guitar practice to daily meditation. We're using it in work now on our team to, to assess uh, reactions to the project, and then it's great to look back and see you get this nice graph, a roller coaster, the ups and downs, and then also get a log too of how things went. And I love to look back a month and see how where I was, what I was working on, and how I've improved. So at MercuryApp.com, everybody should check that out. Make sure you enter my affiliate key. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any techniques they'd like to share, or? <laughs> I'm so clever and everything. And it, helped, it didn't help uh, like a new challenge. So hmm. on a new challenge, I got frustrated because my ego was so high and I just went into it. I just ran into the wall. Right. But then when I switched to ambition, it was like kind of easy to, to get to a new challenge. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point because I kind of mentioned the idea of self. You know, when you, after you accomplish these and you let go of the self and just go into this flow experience and let it happen and lose all sense of self-consciousness. Um, your ego should dissolve, but afterwards you're going to have a stronger sense of self. You're going to be a more complex person because you accomplished this goal. But if the ego gets in the way, it's going to not only inhibit the flow um, because you're thinking about yourself and how you're doing it for yourself instead of just the goal itself or the experience itself. Paul? Can I talk to Max? You <laughs> mentioned uh, the, the thing that makes him most happy is his kids. <laughs> you hear that a lot? And I mean, I, what, from your perspective, how important is kind of things like family and life stability and all of the things that you just hear a lot, I mean, hear a lot mm -hmm. particularly at Ruby Camp. It's all, it's quite cheesy, mm -hmm. but I think it's quite associated with the happiness thing as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, and I feel like the resulting experience, whether it's family or coding or doing music, if you get in that flow experience and cultivate that 
you're going to have the same reward and the same benefit at the end. And it's part of being a balanced life. So I have a, a three-year-old child, and my favorite things to do, probably over anything, is hanging out with him and playing toys with him. And if you spend 20 minutes with your child, it's just this connection and this kind of, you lose track of time. <laughs> I only spend tw one Pomodoro a day is all my child gets. <laughs> but I feel a similar reward, you know, when I hang out with my kids. And I think it's part of being balanced. Otherwise, if, if coding is your only way to experience this happiness, you're going to be antisocial. You know, you're not going to, you're going to lose, you know, if the power goes out, what are you going to do? UPS. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's a good point, and um, that was another point that I missed on my notes because I can't read them. Um, is that, I mean, really, what you're doing is making work more of a game. You know, you have goals, you have feedback, and that's a lot of games are structured that way. And that's why people enjoy them. If you're playing Monopoly, you have a goal, you're getting feedback, you're getting money, you're, you're moving forward, and then you're trying to focus. If you don't focus on the game, you're going to lose. Um, and, then you ha and, and, and the better your skill are, the better you're going to be at the game. So it's, it's very similar to life becomes a game, which it is. <laughs> Any other points anyone would like to share? I'm curious to hear by show of hands as to how many people prefer to get into the zone with music mm. in headphones as opposed to kind of silence. Because I find listening to music, the continuous kind of relatively calm music helps me zone in on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. So the question was, he was interested in how many people listen to music when they code and, and feel like they get into the zone experience versus people who like silence around. So how many people like music when they're coding? <laughs> Most people. <laughs> how many people don't? They like silence. I find for myself, um, I, I often like silence when I code, but I do like music without words. I have a hard time listening to music with words. It seems to interrupt with the same you know, coding sphere, but I think music without w words for me does facilitate that zone because we've all listened to music our whole lives, so it kind of helps get you into that feeling that you're familiar with and then apply that to coding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a good point, because it's not, the flow experience isn't dependent on the actual challenge or the actual skills, it's your perception of that. If you feel like you're skilled enough and the challenge is, you might not actually accomplish it, and you can still get in the flow experience, if you think you are. <laughs> this is a good point. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I could say about that. Sure. I mean, just actually visiting Boston and the person, like, it's about organizing your life in such a way that you have to, like, for me, I live near some train tracks, so if you just give me a city, I know it's super helpful for me. For us, I just live a couple miles from home and, and be, a, be the boss. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, it's, it's really up to you. It's, it's, it can be hard to do, and especially if that's where the daily practice really helps. You know? and, and that's where, that's the difference between, you know, one point is with these 10,000 hours we talk about to master something. And I always think, you know, Malcolm, uh, in his book, he never really talks about, he just equates, if you do 10,000 hours and you master something, which is true, but what motivates those people? There's a difference between the person that actually does it and why do they do it. And, and it's just a point of your emotion and your intention. You have to have an intention and will to order that consciousness and um, so to get into that flow. And the more you do it and first, the more you take that step and especially a daily practice, after a week or two, it's going to be easier. But it is hard to make, you know, it's like when you exercise and run every day, as soon as you get out of the habit, it's hard to get back. One thing to remember with the question of fitting into the day is we all have, say, about 16 hours in a day. I like to sleep eight. Um, you do fit. Everything you do during those 16 hours, you fit into that day. So spend maybe a week or two tracking what you have thought fit into that time. And so, and realize that everything that you do during that day, you've chosen to do during that day. So, you know, a common thing that we say is track how much time you actually watch television, say, and then decide whether or not the, that's a choice you're making. So I, I don't have a television because I like television so much. <laughs> and I, if I have something accessible, I choose to prioritize that over other things. So spend some time tracking it and figure out, oh wow, you know, over these last two weeks I've chosen to fit 30 hours of television watching in. Do I really treat that as a priority over other things? And if you do, that's okay because it's something that is giving you a certain amount of value for yourself. So don't think, don't think about having to fit things in. Think about you already fit them in. Mm -hmm. Now just prioritize them. Yeah, it's a good point, because it's a trade-off. I mean, you know, people you admire that are, you know, whether they're you know, prominent speakers in the Ruby scene or something that you really admire about something, they're trading something off. So people you see very skilled, whether it's a musician, there's something they're not good at. So you have to decide, prioritize what you want to be good at and you can't be good at everything, and that's okay. And you, although we, we want to do that. So you have to trade off things, and whatever you focus on and, and really spend the time on, you're going to be good at. Just a question for Corey. Corey, what do you use to track those things? <laughs> Why, there's this awesome thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can track um, very easy, less than 30 seconds to put in a Just respond to an email. Don't even have to load a web page. <laughs> It's a good point, and, and that's, that's a hard thing to do because we always want to do what we don't like to do or something that's challenging that we really maybe want to attain at. We always do that kind of last, naturally, a lot of times. So when you're doing your tomatoes during the day, you make the first two about the things that are kind of on the list of things that you just have to get done that you've been putting off or something that you're working on daily. Um, just kind of the same way that you should do the riskiest things in a project first and just get those out of the way. Yeah, it's essential. Um, I've gone through years and years of, of a daily practice, and I've gone through periods without that, and it's, it's, there's an empirical difference. Um, just in my general sense of happiness, of accomplishment. It's amazing. Meditation, even if it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, I get more done. It's weird. It's something that helps kind of still the mind so that you're not filling it with things you don't need to do. So the mind quiets, you can really focus on what's important to you. And I've just noticed a tremendous difference of getting more done in the day better, more sense of happiness just without having to have an external thing or goal to work on. Um, so I, I highly recommend it. When I, when I visit a uh, sanctuary, I, I notice it's like a couple different times in the day. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, Blake and I are going to go to our guitar practice. 
Yeah, because yeah, you have those external dependencies, um, especially on social things in the world. And the more anxious, you know, we all get anxious when we see these wars and crazy things going on. So we have to take that away and really have the internal uh, focus and flow without any external dependencies. Yeah, so the, uh, a small little phrase that was coined by uh, Mike Gerhardt, he's this, this dev med thing, dev, uh, developer meditation, um, is so we're always trying to focus on our practice. So why not practice how to focus? So. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think there's hashtag DevMed. There were some people that were, he spoke at uh, Magic Ruby about, just about meditation. And then he had a little, I think some group of them were trying well, to do that for. Audience meditated for 10 minutes. Oh, nice. And um, then the, after that, they were trying to do it for two weeks together and we're talking about it on Twitter. Anything else? I'm sure everybody's hungry. <laughs> so I appreciate your time. Thank you.